there I am. Hello, gamer freaks. I'm Patrick, better known as Kyo Kusagani, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Gradius block. Myself and Super Viper, the person streaming right after me, are gonna take you on an airborne tour through Konami's shoot 'em ups. I am going to close out the attract mode, and I'm going to start a recording in case this ends up being a successful run. Oops, hey, did that disappear on me? Oh, there's my video game. OBS just takes a moment to catch up. <laughs> Gradius 1 and 3 don't need much of an introduction, but you might not have heard of this one unless you were an Xbox buster in the early 2010s. No, busting one of those won't make me feel good. This is Scooter Shooter, released a little bit after Gradius 1. It didn't achieve the same level of cultural success as everyone's glorified Easter Island commercial but it's an innovative game that needs some recognition. As you can see, this and Finalizer Super Transformation were two really obscure games that were stuck in emulator limbo up until Microsoft decided to include them in their ill-fated game compilation. And that's how I was first introduced to this fantastic little game. It is very much designed in the same way a Gradius game is, only you're directly racing against uh, another player. The stages and the showdowns at the end of the stages are like two completely different games in terms of quality. The four levels uh, in your journey are top notch, whereas this game's competitive aspect didn't necessarily catch on because it devolves into camping out in the corners and mashing the fire button as fast as humanly possible. Monkey C button, monkey push button. But everything that's not the competitive aspect is top notch in this game. Sh shields aren't necessarily new in shoot 'em ups. Gradius had one and it's been featured in a game as early as Asteroids Deluxe from 1980. But how many games can you name off the top of your head where that's built right into your ship? The titular scooter covers half your character's side and all of your behind, and it can be used as an offensive tool just as much as it can be used as a defensive tool. Oh, my timer? Oh, thank you for the reminder on that one. I think you can add uh, two minutes for the first stage. Thank you for calling me out on that one. <laughs> thank you, my infinite zero. When I get caught up in a great game like this, sometimes I forget. Now then, getting back to the game at hand. Um, it is like my timer has glitched on me now. What the heck? I can't fix that now that I'm in the middle of a stage. <laughs> ah, well, we're just going to have to leave that be for the time being. Rather than selecting the power-ups at will, you're dispensed the power-up at preset locations in this game, which stimulates your brain as any good shoot 'em up can do. You're never bored playing a game like Gradius 1 or Scooter Shooter, because you're always thinking about the best way to handle preset patterns. You have the R, which gives you four rockets that usually decimate everything across the entire screen. Ah, uh, what in the world is going on now? I'm gonna have to hang up on that person after I'm done on this. Probably shouldn't have my phone right next to me while I'm live streaming. We're doing the game totally, but we're not good at anything else. Yoink. There we go. Get away from my sight. Get out of my sight. Good face in the background, by the way. So this game has the perfect blend of randomized enemies and predetermined patterns that make for an interesting shooter. Konami were so far ahead of their time as far as shooter game design goes. There were still lots of games that followed Galaxian, uh, what was the other popular game at that time? Xevious Whack-A-Mole game design? This is the farthest thing from that imaginable. All four stages are tight, and I think every other shoot 'em up should follow this as a blueprint. It also doesn't have the brutal death penalties a Gradius game would have as well, since all the expected power-ups are at their predetermined locations. The worst case scenario, you lose a bit of your speed when you start your next life, but that's about it. Everything else is all fine and dandy. 
The backgrounds and the backdrops for these games are also top notch. Uh, another thing that makes an interesting shooter is the weird and surreal environments that are present in all these games. You've got ancient Egyptian pyramids, you've got uh, possibly the nuclear holocaust or a synth wave table at the beginning of stage one, like a gorgeous earthscape at sunrise or sunset. Who even knows if this takes place after the apocalypse or if they had a story for this game? I think the developers deliberately leave it to your imagination and just focused on making it as cool as possible. And here you get to see the offensive capabilities of your scooter as well. It doesn't just shield you from bullets, but if there's a turret down there that's impossible to hit, go and slam right into it. Show it who's boss. <laughs> Just the fact that the shield is built right into your ship opens up so many strategic possibilities in this game to keep it nice and fair. Like say you're about to be sandwiched in between two bullets, you can just kill an enemy directly underneath you and pass right underneath them. Has that one just saved my life right there, for instance. And just the fact you're able to turn around in this game was also pretty innovative as well. Did I mention this has some of the best bangers you'll ever hear out of a 1985 game? You'll get a better chance to listen to that in 1-4, because the music will eventually- Oh, I turned my- Oh, I got my fabulous Scarlet Hair all ruined. Now my day is ruined and I have no reason to live anymore. <laughs> Don't ever get your fabulous anime hair shot, otherwise it's curtains for you. As for this particular spot, this is one of the first times where the game forces you to pick a good power-up. There is a safe spot that we're going to be using here on the second loop because just like any good arcade, arcade game should, it loops endlessly as long as you're able to survive. As long as you've got extra lives coming in at every 90,000 points, then you can keep playing as many loops of this as possible. I think the difficulty of this caps out at like loop three or something like that. You know what, Cavacock? Chat is talking a bunch of nonsense that I can't uh, even react to right now. <laughs> but I do know Ordner is a very good game and that's coming up sometime later in this marathon. So yes, despite the fact that these boss fights are misses as far as game design goes, the ideas were definitely there and they inspired future generations of game designers to make games like Twinkle Star Sprites, where you are attacking the opponent on their own separate screen rather than fighting each other directly like this. Toho 3 might also owe itself to Scooter Shooter as well. Now we have one more level to go in loop one. Are these boss, with a second player, you can stall infinitely there with a second player. You know what? Because when one player reaches the end of a level, it automatically forces the other player to the end in order to catch him up. They have timeout mechanics in the stages themselves, but the problem is there's no time limit and the game doesn't do enough to uh, deter you from stalling there. The game will eventually throw more bullet patterns at you and throw intense patterns at you to get you to fight each other or deplete the health bar a little bit, but those boss fight stages, uh, someone is forced to lose a life on those. So, if the operator actually disabled extends, there would be no way for the second player to actually finish the game. If the second player dies, then the second player is gone for good, just like Contra and whatnot. You can't, con the second player can only continue if he dies in a level and not a boss fight. So I'd imagine that, uh, the continues were a bit of an afterthought when it came to this game. I think they tried to add them in at the last second, so the competitive aspect is definitely flawed. But as a single player game, it's on par with every other Gradius game made in this decade. I'm gonna let you guys bang out to this for a while because this is the best song in for 1985. This is what I mean about letting you control your own speed. Oh shoot! That's a difficult corridor, so I might lose another life there in that section. You gotta take your time and activate all those turrets launching out at you early. The closer you get to them, the more crap you have to deal with. You start spawning the rest of the mobs around here. 
but you can play this as cautiously or as recklessly as you want. That also gives this game speed run potential, as you guys might have guessed. A loop of this is like t uh, 10 minutes, but since I have to take my time more frequently in loop two, I made my estimate 25 minutes. And then the final obstacle before you reach the end of your adventure, it's just a swathe of enemies that spawn in at complete random. Nothing I can do there except try again and be more diligent with my dexterity. Let me focus in on a second and then I can commentate again after I'm done with this. I find the barrier is often the best choice for this section, although a speed up also does you a lot of good here as well. There we go! Look, the idiot down there decided to give up. That's no way to live your life in the 1980s. <laughs> Second, second player having a bold choice. I think the hurry up enemies will actually spawn on the CPU if the CPU stalls there for too long. <laughs> and then we've reached uh, whatever the end of the enemy base is. I think we're going to assume that this is the Bacterion base or the traditional base you see at the end of every Gradius game. I don't know what the winner gets right here. Maybe we get control of the entire world up until this point. Oh, and even as early as 1985, this game actually did have Konami rank in it. Picking up the barrier actually makes the enemy attacks more intense temporarily. Like right here, for instance, that those are hurry up enemies that actually force uh, both players to start moving. And that was one loop. We are far from done here, though. We fought our way through the apocalypse and all we got was a sheet of paper, a sheet of toilet paper, declaring that we are the greatest warrior in the world. <laughs> now we get to go back in time and do it all over again. Welcome to loop two, where more suicide kamikaze enemies are spawning from behind. Now you have to be on your toes at all times and you're forced to take your time a bit more frequently. Collecting a speed up negates the suicide enemies a lot of the time, but not all the time, though. You're given like uh, six minutes to get through every single level before the time over enemies start showing up. So you have a lot of time to strategize in every single stage. More than enough time, as a matter of fact. Leeching is still discouraged heavily in a single player game anyway, because you're inevitably going to have an enemy that spawns right on top of your head. These guys start spawning out of nowhere and whatnot. So theoretically you can leech, but not really. You guys can make up your own theories on if this is a sequel to track and field or not, or a statement on nuclear proliferation like Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> So yes, picking up the barrier will actually increase the rank of the game tenfold. But at the same time, the rank buff uh, goes away when your barrier disappears. So I find it to be a good idea to go after the barrier regardless of what my circumstances are. The last note that I'd like to have here is that I'd really like to, uh, I'd really like to know who the music designer for this game was, because. That is easily the second greatest part of this game, aside from the game design itself. Either that's a giant sunset being covered up by clouds in the background, or that's a nuke, like I mentioned earlier. Maybe there's some hidden lore around here that I am unaware of. There's no guarantees for me finishing this, though. You guys say this looks very marathonable, but it's very easy to slip up and lose your lives if uh, you're not attentive for one moment in the slightest. That's what makes this game so awesome as an arcade game, and uh, Gradius 1 in particular. It respects the player's skill, and you get a crap ton of value out of your quarter, quarter if you really put the time and effort into a game like this. Yank, I can't say the same for player two since someone's inevitably going to have to die at one point, unless the operator decreases the extend scores which is entirely doable. If you set both of the lives to five, I think the second player can actually clear a loop if you set the lives to five. But don't, 
but don't quote me on that one. That's assuming the second player never dies at all. And now we know how to CPU. If you look at the CPU down there, he doesn't know how to handle the second loop in the slightest. He's not programmed to deal with that. <laughs> Shoot, I have to focus here. One, three, two, one. Get out of here, squid. Those squids are just kidding around. Both players can clear. Yeah, you can alternate debts and both players could probably clear on default settings, Flannel Cat. That's a really good idea. This is a game that's playable on Fightcade and GGPO. So if someone logs into Red GGPO or Fightcade, we can probably have a competitive match of this together because I'd imagine that would be fun racing each other through the stages. There's no benefit to racing each other through the stages, but that would be fun indeed. Although as far as co-op shoot 'em ups go, I think they did a better job with Life Force in particular because Life Force, you weren't competing against each other. That's when they actually created different ship types with different strengths and weaknesses. Either it was Life Force that came out first or Devil World. Devil World was also a game where uh, they made both characters' abilities separate. The power-up orders were different if you played as Labrina or Condor in that game. I should really consider submitting that to um, Coin Up Classic next year, among many other obscure Tanami titles from their back catalog. Look at that, you know, I, I was off talking about how uh, good Konami was, I wasn't paying attention to the game, and that flying pancake farted on me. <laughs> Okay, give me barrier. That also caused Konami to split the leaderboards for the first time between both sides because they realized, oh shoot, uh, some players might find one side objectively better than the other. So they splitted the leaderboards for both player sides, starting with Devil World. I don't think there's any tangible difference between the players in this, though. It's just the patterns are mirrored to the left and right. Someone ought to do research on uh, what differences there are between player one and player two. Also, I can't believe I didn't die from that. I barely grazed through that whatsoever. I can never get enough of this song. <laughs> this is what I meant when I said I needed to take my time in loop two. Ah, shoot! That one was a direct hedge. We're gonna be showing off a safe spot because your scooter ends up creating possibilities like those. There might be a ton more safe spots to discover in this game other than this one, but this is the mandatory safe spot coming up. I don't have very good consistency with this because the enemies are placed further on the left side of the screen at the boss location here. Sure, I'll take a rocket here. All right, around here, underneath the first digit, right? Yeah, that's the stuff right there. That's the stuff. Oh, that wasn't the safe spot. I forgot where the safe spot was. Where was the safe spot again? Oh, no. Was it under the second digit? I have to do this the normal way. I forgot where the safe spot was. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'll just take a barrier and then I'm going to hope for the best in this instance. I forgot. Hm. The trick here is to misdirect the bullets so that your barrier doesn't take as much abuse. This is gonna be nasty. It's so nasty because you have such limited space to move on the second loop. Come back here, you craven little coward. I'll forget you. Who needs you anyway? And then we get to the final stage. 2-4. Two, 2-4 four. Two, four is the nastiest thing I have ever seen out of this game, bar none. There's no tricks to this level whatsoever. You just gotta do it. You gotta buckle down. You gotta be a man, in my instance, or whatever gives you inspiration. And you just gotta do it. Darn it. It's 
I'm resisting the urge to swear as much as possible, even though I am normally a little bit of a sailor mouth. Uh, you know what? Just in case. I feel like I'm doing a very good job of that right now, and I barely scraped through that. Whew. I would have been mad if I died on the easy boss fight. <laughs> there are so many good arcade games through time. Yes, they are. In fact, I said this on my channel once before, but 1985 in particular and 1984 are when arcade games really started getting amazing, in my honest opinion. The early years were the innovative years where they you know, learned how to make Donkey Kongs and they learned how to make platformers. I respect that for what they are, even though those games are a bit primitive. But 1985 and onwards, uh, the late 80s was all about innovation and improving what was already there to create epic storylines and tight levels. I couldn't do anything about that. I was stunned. Hmm. I'll save it for afterwards. But yeah, games started getting truly incredible in the late 80s with super refined controls and gameplay mechanics. That's easily one of my favorite decades as far as video games go. And it's good to see someone appreciating Pac-Land in chat as well. But I actually beat Super Mario Brothers by an entire year and it was one of the first to have a preset package of 32 levels in it. Mario totally copied that to an extent. Right, this is the nastiest part of the game. Oh, oh. I did my best. I did my best. I got to showcase almost all of the entire game before the point where it starts becoming marathonable. The only difference on the third loop is that they start bringing out the suicide bullets at that point. And then once you get to loop three, then you can start marathoning the game consistently from that point forward. Ay, 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 ay. I'm gonna kill it off right there. Thank you for the GG's, everyone. I'm going to give the, wait, I'm gonna get the timer this time around. I'm not used to using timer. I finally unglitched it. <laughs> uh, let's add two extra minutes onto that. So that run lasted 22 minutes, counting the first stage. I'm gonna give the moderation team time to set up for the next game now. And I will catch you once they are done doing their setup. We gotta try to redeem ourselves with Gradius 1 now. Although that was pretty darn good. I am satisfied with the way that turned out. See you in a moment.